Hello, Professor Doc Miller, EDU 522 at Marion University. This is our virtual meeting this week. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and get right into it. Uh, last week, we looked at our course standards that are individual to each of our courses, and we broke them down or unpacked them into um, key concepts and vocabulary that students would need to master in order to meet uh, the, the benchmark that that standard sets. This week, we're gonna take that to the next level by authoring objectives for each of the lessons it would take to get students there. In other words, we're gonna go, well, how many lessons is it gonna take, and what is my goal for each one of those lessons? Um, so, in preparation for this, you should have completed the standards unpacking for key concepts and vocabulary, uh, and you should have also reviewed your Teach Like a Champion text, uh, the begin with the end technique, and the four M's technique, which we'll dive into here shortly. So uh, let's go ahead and start um, with sort of a, a do now. This is obviously gonna be uh, a little different um, than maybe what you're used to uh, with the do now because we're not there. But here's what I'd like for you to think about and just take a minute and press pause once, once uh, I finish here. I'd like for you to think about your favorite food to either cook or eat, all right? In your mind, think about, well, what ideas or skills would we need to cover in order to teach somebody, I said cover, uh, would we need to teach somebody in order to make that dish? What order would you teach them in? And how would you know if they were successful? Press pause, take a second, and think about that. Now, if you're thinking this through, no matter what idea or, or what uh, recipe you really came up with, you probably came up with a few sort of consistent ideas. Number one, we need to teach people what, what that dish or what that, that, that item really is, right? Uh, we probably said, well, we need to teach them the ingredients. <laughs> uh, and we probably need to teach them how to, how to put it all together. If it was a complicated dish, you may have had to teach a specific discrete skill, like uh, if you were teaching somebody to make fettuccine Alfredo, but you wanted to do from scratch pasta. Well, that's, that's a different level. Like we would need to teach that somewhere else, not at the very end. So the idea is if, we were, if we're gonna teach somebody something, we've gotta break it down into parts where they can, they can take one part and then build on the next part. And we add those building blocks together. But what is equally as important as the building blocks you choose is the order in which you deliver them, right? We've got to arrange them in an order that makes sense. But ultimately, we need to know if we were successful. So ideally, what you probably said is I'm gonna have them make the dish and I'll taste it to make sure it's right. But hopefully, what we've looked into here is that, well, um, I need to check along the way <laughs> to make sure that, that we're making the progress we need. Otherwise, we're gonna end up with something that we, we probably don't really expect to, to eat. All right. So in this lesson, we're gonna do begin with the end and four M's, but more specifically, we're gonna apply this to the context of the unpacking assignment that we started last week. Uh, our objectives are pretty clear. They should be on your screen. Uh, we're gonna identify the knowledge and skills students need to master in order to meet a grade level or course standard. Uh, and then we're gonna write manageable, measurable objectives for individual students that focus on the most important content or skill that student needs to master. We're also gonna use later and throughout the lesson our unpack standards for a specific grade level to determine the number of topics and impart the sequence of lessons that students would need in order to reach mastery. And we are gonna focus on sequence in our next lesson, but we've gotta figure out the, the order first, okay? So we are gonna be looking at begin with the end first, and that's what we're gonna start off with, and then we'll move on to writing objectives. And we are gonna take an extra step here uh, because of what we learned last week about process standards and literacy standards and see how we're gonna integrate those. But let's consider our uh, do now for a second. Let's say that my standard uh, from our do now was I want students to be able to make fettuccine Alfredo. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. Well, this is what I want them to make, right? creamy uh, sauce, noodles, real pretty. But what would I do if this is what they made, <laughs> right? 
well, I guess the first question is, what what went wrong? What are some of the things that could have gone wrong here? Now, clearly, uh, they could have used wrong ingredients. Uh, maybe they put them together in the wrong order. Uh, they could have overcooked or undercooked or undermixed or overmixed, right? Uh, or they may not have known what it was supposed to look and taste like in the first place. So there are a number of things that could have gone wrong. Uh, but many of those could have been could have been prevented if one, I taught the lesson in an order that made sense, and number two, I assessed their understanding along the way. So today, what we're going to do is make those goals, make those little goals, figure out how to assess them, and then, like I said earlier, we're going to start putting those uh, into a, a logical order. All right. So let's refer to what you reviewed and begin with the end. Begin with the end really starts with a comprehensive view of what the unit is supposed to be. Before we can effectively lesson plan, it's important for us to get a big picture idea of what the lesson will lead to. If lessons are taught as individual standalone parts, it's going to be difficult for students to build connections to the bigger ideas. In other words, we just have little wins that don't accumulate to much. This means that we need to start not just with a lesson objective, but with a series of objectives that we know we're going to be teaching in a certain sequence. Okay. Now, once the, once the big picture is established, we can then break it down into measurable and manageable objectives. But those objectives are going to look different depending on what we're teaching. So, for example, content-based objectives are looking for students to master concepts related to some academic uh, content, right? So if we think back to our conversation about Bloom's taxonomy the other day, these are really knowledge and comprehension objectives. Now, I don't want to minimize the importance of these. Students have to have a mastery, knowledge, and understanding of certain content in order to move forward, right? Those absolutely have to happen, and there are times where that is the objective of the lesson, that students will be able to describe the connection between blank and blank, right? But skill-based objectives take us a little bit higher, and ultimately what we want to do is take content-based objectives and stack them together so students can meet skill-based objectives. And this is where we're really applying the content uh, or analyzing or evaluating or even creating. Now, in terms of how do we know we're there, we do have to assess, right? So we need to ask ourselves, how do I know if students are going to be successful? Or how do I know, more importantly, if they were successful? What method of assessment I'm going to use to do that? And I really want to start with, what is the ideal response? In other words, I want to begin with the end. I would love to see a student who can provide this answer for me, right? Um, that means that we've got to think about the assessment before we begin building a lesson. Right. Uh, the other thing to consider here is an assessment isn't just something that is done at the end of the lesson. What we need to think about is how do we build an assessment that kind of checks as we go. Those checks for understanding are critical. But then we're going to move to our lesson plan. We're going to break down these standards into manageable daily lessons, each one of them with their own objective and each one of them with their own check for understanding. And again, you assess as you go. All right. So. What we're going to do now is look at how do we know what kind of standard we should be dealing with. Well, if you've already done your check, your uh, your breakdown from last week, which obviously you should have done, um, we're going to determine what the standard is really asking for. Now, that means that there could be multiple things that the standard's asking for. So we've got to figure out where where we are in that spectrum. There are really three different types of building blocks or three different areas that a standard is going to ask us to do. The first is students need to be able to master some sort of factual knowledge. These are the basic elements students need to know or be acquainted with in order to, to master a discipline to solve a problem or whatever. In short, the standard needs to tell us or we need to figure out from the standard what should students know. Right, um, so we're gonna we're gonna identify these are factual things that are key components. The next thing is conceptual. Conceptuals uh, content are gonna be those things where they're interrelations 
between basic elements. In other words, they kind of string together factual things uh, to a broader concept uh, and, and see how they uh, function together. Um, so if we want to ask ourselves uh, when we're reading a standard, it's, it's really what should a student understand? The difference being students should be able to know, like they know a definition, but students should be able to understand how that definition and, and this idea kind of merge together to, to a bigger idea. So we have factual content and we have conceptual content, but ultimately we really want students to get to procedural information. And that is how do you, how do they do something? Um, these are methods of inquiry or criteria um, of using skills, algorithms, techniques, methods. So, this is when we look at a standard and go, well, what is the standard asking for students to do? So when we look at a standard, we want to go, well, what is it asking for students to know? What do they need to understand and what do they need to do? Uh, I think what might be best here is to look at a couple of standards and say, okay, well, what's happening in that standard? What's it really asking, right? And this is something that you've kind of done already, but what I want to do is refine it and make sure that we're thinking about it in the right way or in, a, in an efficient way. So let's take uh, this standard. This is from the uh, Indiana Academic Standards for Seventh Grade Science. Um, investigate Newton's second law of motion and show the relationship among force, mass, and acceleration, right? I'd like for you to pause when I say and ask yourself, what factual information do students need to know? What conceptual information do students need to know? And then ultimately, what procedures or processes do students need to be able to conduct in order to master the standard? Press pause now and consider that, and then I'll put up some ideas that came up on my end. So here are the factual things uh, that I think this standard really calls for. First off, students will obviously need to be able to, to, to identify Newton's second law or define it. Um, now, mass is mentioned, so they need to be able to know mass, and I put the units there because I think that's an essential thing, right? Um, so they need to know what mass is and how it's, how it's measured. Um, acceleration, right, when they need to know velocity and time, which are building blocks to that. And then ultimately force, right? These are all concepts, or, or excuse me, facts that are listed in the standard, right, that they can, they can easily define. However, if we take it more to a conceptual level, we'll, Students are going to need to know how velocity plays into this. So in other words, how do we use velocity to determine acceleration? Uh, which means that my lesson previous to this will probably be on velocity. Um, students will need to, to know how acceleration and mass are used to determine the force of an object. Uh, and students will need to be able to, to know how the changes in mass and acceleration or acceleration affect force. Right? These are concepts where you go, okay, well, if the mass increases, then what happens to the force? Right? But ultimately, procedurally, we want students to be able to calculate force of a given object if we have its mass and acceleration, or students need to be able to calculate the change in force if mass or acceleration changes. So these factual, conceptual, and procedural things build on each other. They're building blocks where students would have to master the factual elements in order to really get the concept down. And they're gonna to have to completely comprehend the concept in order to conduct the procedural element that the standard ultimately is asking for them to do. And remember that the standard's asking for investigate. It's not saying students will be able to define or students will be able to explain, it's students will be able to investigate. All right, let's take this to another standard. This time we'll use a biology standard. Uh, this is B53, which it says apply concepts of statistics and probabilities to support a claim that organisms with an adv uh, advantageous heritable trait tend to increase in proportion to organisms lacking that trait. Let's do this again. Press pause and identify factual, conceptual, and procedural elements that you think would be in this lesson, and we'll compare what I came up with. All right. In terms of the factual elements, obviously students need to know what probability is, right? Now we may assume that students know that, but I would definitely want to check for understanding before I ever did that, right? I also need to know what a heritable trait is, right? Students need to be able to identify, oh, it's the organisms got this trait from their, from their parents and so forth on. But they also need to be able to differentiate between what, is, what do we mean by an advantageous trait or, or a favorable trait and then ultimately, this is really leading to natural selection. Students need to be able to kind of define, here's what natural selection really is. Conceptually, students need to be able to identify that, that uh, 
conditions and factors in an environment have an effect on a species, specifically its population numbers. And students need to be able to identify that there are certain traits that show a favor, right? So if we look at populations, students need to be able to go, oh, well, that trait seems to show up more often. That's conceptual, right? Procedurally, students need to be able to, if given a population, demonstrate changes due to those different traits, right? Or show differences in populations uh, or, 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 or uh, numbers within a population um, that, that have that trait versus those that do not, and be able to graphically represent that, right? Now, I want to note something here that graphical representation really takes this back to the process standards that are listed in our, in our overall standards. So, um, what we want to do there, is, and we'll get to how we apply this later, but notice that the procedural elements really are driving rigor here. Um, it's not just enough that students can define natural selection, and it's not enough quite yet to say students can look at conditions and kind of go, oh, I see, I see how that might affect a population, uh, you know, individuals in a population. What we really want them to be able to do is demonstrate that uh, by way of a model. Uh, using graphical analysis or something like that. So what I'd like for you to do, and you can do this anyway, you can either watch the whole video uh, and then go back and do this. What I think would be ideal is to stop now uh, and do this with the activity that we started last week. So what you will need to do is get the activity, um, the, the standards unpacking template that you started that has your key concepts and vocabulary in it, uh, and review that quickly. For each of those, identify what key concepts of vocabulary are actual factual information, build out the conceptual, so make sure that maybe you've listed some that are conceptual, and then identify those that are processes. Now, if it were me, and I'm going to let you do this however you want, I would use the color coding that you see on your screen right here, where factual information, maybe you code it green, conceptual, you code blue, uh, and procedural, you code um, orange. But what I would expect to happen, if, if this is starting to really sink in, is that you will probably be adding some things, where you go, oh, I get the key, the key vocabulary, and maybe you have some of the concepts built in, but maybe we're starting to add some more procedural elements where we go, this is really what the standard is driving at. So take some time and do that in that column that says key concepts and vocabulary. While you do that, I'm going to go pet my dog. All right? So enjoy. All right. I'm assuming you paused and did that or, or we're watching on. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to move forward to standards writing. All right. Uh, we're going to go and, and actually leverage our Teach Like a Champion uh, book here. Um, I think 4Ms is a really great way to, to, uh, to approach writing clear objectives because there are really four essential criteria. The first thing that we need to consider when we're going to write a lesson objective, and, and maybe we need to stop here for a minute and differentiate what we mean between an objective and a standard. Remember that a standard is by the end of the course, right? Standards are big ticket items that are the umbrella under which a course operates. An objective really should be a daily goal, right? So if a standard is a by the end of the course goal, an objective is a daily goal. And we should be able to know whether we've accomplished that at the end of the day. An objective, first and foremost, must be manageable, right? The way I approach this is if I look at an objective or I look at a concept and I go, I can break that down into three to five distinct key points. And I can teach a key point, check for understanding, teach the next one and connect it, check for understanding, teach, connect, check for understanding, right? If I'm looking at um, an idea, let's say I've, I have an operating objective, one that I've already written, um, and it doesn't, it, it breaks down to like eight or nine things. I gotta ask myself, is that manageable? Right, can I really, number one, teach to mastery and check for understanding of all of those things in one class period? 
If the answer is no, then it's not manageable. But the opposite is also true. If I have a, a, an objective, it's got one key point or two key points, and I can, I can teach it and I can check for understanding, is that enough to press, to, to push students uh, for rigor? Is it enough to take an entire class period? If not, maybe I need to up the rigor of my objective, right? So manageable just says, is it something that can be done in a full class period? Is it something that, that would take a full class period? If not, we need to adjust accordingly. The next thing, and which is probably the most important, is that students need to be able to measure their success. More and more, you need to be able to measure their success. Um, now, this is sort of a sticking point. This is sort of a, a um, one of those things that we see frequently, and you're probably going to go, even if you have lessons that are, that are written by your school or organization, we inevitably find issues with this. Um, the terms that lead off our objectives really need to be measurable. We need to know what success looks like. So if we start an objective with students will be able to identify, well, I can, I can assess identification in a variety of different ways. Describe, again, I could have students verbally do that. I can have students write a description. Uh, I can have students look at something and describe the connection there. So defining, comparing, modeling, constructing, these are all things that, that, that I can build an assessment around. But we often see objectives that are not measurable because they start with students will be able to feel or know or students will be able to understand. I don't know, I don't know how that, me I don't know how we have measure that, right? So if we look back at our objectives, there should be a clear indicator as here's what success looks like. And if there's not, then how do we know we made it? So let's consider that when we're writing our objectives. Another part that, that the Teach Like a Champion text really focuses on is your objective needs to be made first, right? Here's what that really means. We should never start an objective with here's this activity I want kids to do. How do I retrofit it to make it important? Well, we don't, right? What we should do is start out with, here's what I want students to be able to do. Oh, this activity or this, this, this um, lesson component will get them there, right? We can't flip it around. So if I ask you uh, to, to teach an objective that students will be able to complete a Venn diagram that shows the similarities and differences between animals and plants. well. What, what is that objective about? Is it about students who would be able to use Venn diagrams? Or is it students are being able to differentiate between plants and animals? If I'm, a, if I'm a biology or science teacher, then obviously plants and animals is really the core there. But I end up stressing Venn diagrams. That, that's not the case. Now, that doesn't mean I can't use a Venn diagram as an assessment or as an activity. It just means that's not what I'm assessing. That's not what I'm looking for, right? The final thing to keep in mind is that it does need to be the most important, right? So, so what we want to make sure is that our objective really stresses those critical things that, uh, and we're talking about critical skills or content um, that students need to be able to master. Your objective needs to be connected to the overall goal in a meaningful way, right? We don't want to nitpick, right, and say, all right, uh, this, this, little, this little isolated idea that really doesn't have any bearing is the thing I'm going to use as my assessment. That's an aha gotcha moment. That, that, that deteriorates the, the quality of your class, and it's going to make your students angry, and then if your students are angry, and then you're angry, and then it's a, a positive feedback loop. It just builds to anger, and everybody hates each other when fires start. Uh, maybe took that too far. All right, so let's consider these manageable, measurable, made first, and most important as we look at some standards and go, well, how many objectives would it take to teach that, All right? Um, to make this easy, I'm going to use the two standards we've already looked at. So we're going to start with the seventh grade standard. We're going to do a biology standard. So this is our seventh grade standard, right? Investigate Newton's second law of motion and show the relationship among forces, mass, and acceleration. Awesome. Well, if I look at this, 
I see, and there's not a right or wrong answer here. It's just by looking at it and looking at those key concepts, vocabulary, and procedures, I am going to look and see that there are really four ideas that I want students to be able to master. First, students will be able to identify the velocity, mass, and acceleration of a moving object, right? Those are properties. So this is really a, a relatively low-end objective that says I need to make sure that they have these, these facts, they know what velocity is, and, and we're getting into that conceptual idea of they can identify that it has velocity or something. Another relatively low objective, right, but still has to happen, is students will be able to explain Newton's second law, right? This is a conceptual objective because they need to explain something. Now, notice it says students won't be able to, it doesn't say students will be able to define, it says they'll be able to explain. And there's a difference. Defining is regurgitating what's written in the book. Explaining is students will be able to use their own words. Um, students will be able to see it, see the concept in action, right? Then we get into more procedural elements where we go students will be able to calculate the force of a moving object using its mass and acceleration. This could be an opportunity for students to have some really great practice at calculating. Finally, students predict the change in force of a moving object and justify their prediction using experimentation, right? This is definitely a procedural objective, right? But if we looked at this as four separate lessons, we might be able to see here that the first objective really gets students comfortable with the ideas, the facts. The next one really stretches their ability to see this as a concept. The third one arches over and starts to go, okay, now use that concept in a procedure. And then the fourth one really digs into procedural where they're, they're actually moving objects and calculating their force and things like that. Then, and we'll do this here in a little bit, I could look and go, well, how would I know if students have mastered the first objective, which is to identify velocity, right? I could very easily give them a prompt and say, what is the velocity of this object? What is the mass of the object? What is the acceleration, right? If I go into Newton's second law, I could ask students, you know, describe what happened using Newton's second law. And students would have to use their understanding of Newton's second law to explain the result of an action. Um, in terms of calculating force, this one seems pretty easy, right? We'd have give students some sample problems and have them show that they're able to calculate using mass and acceleration. And ultimately, when we get to the last one, we're really talking about the assessment being some sort of a lab activity where students find the force of an object that they are dropping or that they are moving, something like that. All right. Um, let's take a look at the biology standard and see if we can do the same thing. Right, this is where we're applying the, the, the concepts of statistics and probability to support a claim that organisms with an advantageous heritable trait tend to increase in proportion to organisms lacking that trait. Well, obviously we need to, 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 for students to be able to describe the concept of natural selection. Now, what we may be missing here is students will be able to identify what a species is. Students will be able to identify what a population or a community is. Um, but that's where we get to the next uh, objective, which is students identify conditions and environmental factors and explain how they can affect different populations. In other words, students need to be able to, to explain the concept that species are impacted by their environment, right? Next, students predict changes within a population based on the environmental factors and traits within the population. In other words, students need to be able to predict what would happen. If I know this population, uh, all the organisms have one trait or the other, I add in an, a, an element, a factor, a condition, can I predict what would happen, right? This might be looking like uh, I've got a population of rabbits, rabbits that range from white to black. Um, what happens if, if that area is constantly under snow, right? Um, and students, can, can we get them there? Finally, students will test their predictions of changes within a population using a model, right? This time, instead of using experimentation, I used a model for two different reasons. Number one, we're talking about really evolution, so it's really difficult to do that inside a classroom. So a model 
I and the student should be able to identify as a better option here. The other thing is I maybe I did some experimentation like I did with the seventh grade standard. I'm actually pushing a different process standard here, which we'll get to here in a second. All right. So this is really where the rubber meets the road. And this is sort of the bulk of where you're going to be spending the rest of your time. So I want to get to the practice for this round. This is something where I'm going to encourage you to start this. Maybe do one uh, unit or maybe do three or four standards and then come back to the video, right? You're going to do this for all your standards, but this is where I want to make sure you get some good practice. What I'd like for you to do is to review the standards that you unpack during week two and, of course, what we, what we just looked at in our previous practice. Uh, for each of those standards, write a series of objectives that will lead students to mastery of the overall standard like we did in the two previous examples. In other words, maybe we have a standard about the more mastering the factual, factual and conceptual, something like that, and then getting to those higher level procedural standards, right? While you're doing that, use a gut check. After you've written a standard, make sure that it meets the criteria for 4M. Is it manageable? In other words, is this something you can do in a class period? Is it measurable? Is there a clear result that would indicate students have mastered that objective. Is it made first? In other words, it should not be centered around an activity that you already know you're gonna do. And is it most important? In other words, does it clearly align with the standard, pushing the content that the standard directly relates to? All right, so here's what I was gonna suggest you do. Pick three, four standards that you've already unpacked and write the number of objectives that would it, it would take to teach those standards to mastery and then gut check those using your 4M model. Press pause and then come back. At the end of the week, you should have done that for all of your standards. So by the end of the week, this should be completely built out. But for right now, let's practice with three or four standards. You can go ahead and press pause. Hopefully you've gone ahead and written uh, several standards, or sorry, objectives. Uh, for your unpacked lessons and, and maybe you're starting to see well I, I can see that the standard really is going to take two three days four or five days maybe the standard will be taught over a week or two right but now that you're starting to get here's what the scope of the standard is we can really start to see oh the standards are overall picture and my objectives are really going to be what drives that and drives students to mastery the next thing we want to hit on is content alignment a uh, course alignment and academic rigor, right? Um, we've already tiptoed into this and we've explained it a little bit, but I think it's important to go ahead and pivot it here. At this point, once we have our objectives, it's important to make sure that those objectives do meet the, um, the goals and scope of the overall course, okay? In Indiana, that means we systematically integrate the grade level course literacy and process standards, right? The grade level or course literacy and process standards. So what is critical is that once we have our objectives, we wanna make sure that we are consistently asking students to develop in those literacy and process areas. So that means that that's gonna drive kind of our activities. And I mentioned that earlier with the objectives that I wrote in biology in seventh grade was that the experimental part of the seventh grade standard really was about process standards, right? And the model portion, right, or the graphical analysis portion, those are all part of the literacy and process standards. So let's take a minute and review what those topics are, all right? The literacy standards, which again, are promoting reading as a, and writing as a fundamental skill in all content areas, uh, have seven different standards for science, all right? Uh, and it doesn't matter what grade level or um, course you're teaching, these, these literacy standards really are the same, and they are developmental. So we're, we're going to be pivoting back to these. Um, the learning outcome for literacy and technical subject areas really refers to students are able to read in the content area. Students are able to extract information from text about that content area. Uh, LST2 is 
key ideas and textual support. In other words, students are able to identify ideas and concepts and use the text to support their understanding. This can be really well implemented in good discussions when we just ask students, how did you get that? Why did you get that? Can you tell me where in the text we can find that, right? Structural elements and organization. This is really where we shift to writing, right? So maybe we're providing students in our prompts some more guidance on how they really need to be structuring their prompt. What are the things that are a minimal uh, in, in, in what would be an acceptable response? Next up, we get to synthesis and connection of ideas, right? Again, this is all about writing and how students really process um, the ideas that they have by justifying the, the information that comes through in their writing. Um, we're, we're going to connect the ideas maybe that we've learned in class or from reading into an explanation from our writing. Uh, writing genres is, is a pretty scant ver uh, uh, standard because it really has to do with science. We're talking about students reading technical language. Um, this is the same uh, that would uh, literacy standard that would be in um, social studies, but obviously the genres are a little bit different. Then we get to the writing process and the research process. Obviously, we want students to be doing research. Obviously, we want students to be processing how we write. So we're talking about maybe getting students to the point of thinking about how scientists write. Uh, and of course, if we can pivot back to the scientific method. Um, and this, these are things that we, we want to make sure that students are having the opportunity to connect back to, not just once. This is not a one and done situation. This is we're consistently pivoting back to that. What's nice about this and what I think as a teacher we need to be thinking about is this really gives us some ideas of the kind of activities we really want our students engaging in, right? So if I have a worksheet that students are doing every day, I don't know that I'm really pushing literacy standards, right? But this first one, this LST1, hmm, I wonder if this is a great opportunity for students to read something that has to do with this. Maybe there's a story in the news or maybe there's a, a really exciting development or, or maybe you recall an article um, that was in a weird place. Like, you're like, I didn't, you know, this is a great place to, to read about science and I didn't even know it was there, right? These are great opportunities to go, oh, I can integrate that there. That could be fun. That could be different. It's something new. Uh, let's take a look at the process standards now. These are probably something you're, you're a little more consistently thinking about in science because this is, this is usually the way most of us are trained in our scientific background. Um, because they really anchor back to the scientific method. Um, but posing questions and defining problems. This standard tells us we want students to be asking questions, right? Not all of our, all of our lessons need to be here. This is your problem. Answer it. We want them to do some of that defining, right? Uh, developing and using models and tools, which if you recall, our objective really did, right? Uh, constructing and performing investigations. This is students conducting labs and asking the question. Uh, analyzing and interpreting data. Again, if we look at that seventh grade standard where we're having them graph, we're really having them analyze and interpret data. And they are also using the process standard five, which is using mathematics and conceptual thinking. Constructing explanations and designing solutions is another one that is taking our results and taking them a step further. Uh, and to some degree, our, um, our last standard in the biology standard where students are, are constructing those models for explanation, that's really what's happening because we, we can't see evolution happen. So they're using a model to develop that explanation. Uh, engaging an argument from evidence. We refer to that and that connected really back to the learning outcome from literacy, right? Where we could really pivot those two together as long as we're doing that, you know, periodically or systematically throughout a course. Uh, and, and finally, obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information. These really connect to the learning standards, or sorry, the literacy standards six and seven, where we're going, okay, I want you to obtain information, evaluate it, write it, and communicate it, or, or figure out a way to do presentations and things like that. Again, these, these literacy and process standards can drive the kinds of activities um, that we're doing in our class that really punch up uh, and excite students to get into learning science. And I want to go ahead and take just a really quick second here to, to, to put this out there. Sometimes when we have classes that are, are somewhat difficult to manage or to influence, our reaction is let's not give them any sort of, of, of push 
because they can't handle it. I would encourage you to really look at why students are having difficulty engaging. Might it be, and I would argue that a lot of times it is, that they are not engaging with the content in a meaningful way. So sometimes pressing the gas and really getting into some, some rigorous things could elevate those students to engage because they don't necessarily see the value when they're just filling out worksheets or writing notes, right? So again, sometimes if we're having an issue with class management, our, our, our gut reaction is to pause and push back. Nope, we're just gonna sit here and do worksheets. When in fact, what the better answer could have been, depending on the situation, was to accelerate and go, okay, let's push through this and get to the activity or the action part. So here's what we'd like to do for this next step, okay? And this is really where um, we're gonna make sure that our objectives were measurable. You're gonna review the objectives you wrote in the previous practice. For each group of standards, identify ways to make sure that the literacy and process standards are implemented. Now, that doesn't mean you have to implement every literacy standard and every process standard in every unit. It means that over the scope of the course, we need to systematically put these in multiple times, multiple times, right? Not one and done. Each literacy and process standard should be pushed throughout the course. So let's find ways where we can integrate that throughout every unit. So again, not every literacy standard needs to be covered in every unit, but every unit should have anchors back to the literacy standards and anchors back to the process standards. Then, to know how we're going to assess these, let's identify how can I assess this? Are we gonna do a test or a quiz? Are we gonna do a writing prompt? What are we looking for? Are we gonna do an experiment? Are we gonna do a project, right? So, so very quickly, and you don't have to develop the assessment, just note for yourself, this could be assessed, how, how could you be ass assessing that objective? And let's put that parenthetically at the end of each objective, right? So let's go quiz, writing prompt. Now this is not a complete list. You could use a variety of different things, but make sure that if you have an objective, you have a clear idea of this is how I would probably assess it, right? That is actually the end of what I'm expecting from us this week. So let me be very clear on what we're looking for. At the end, of, when we meet in class next week, the big template should be completed. You should have a column of all your standards sorted by unit. Again, that's, you can use whatever your school already uses as your unit plan. You can use by groups. You can create your own units depending on what you think. Um, it's totally okay if they're out of sequence because you've, you've, you've bumped them and moved standards around to meet student needs. We're actually gonna get into that in our next lesson on, on how, to, how to kind of hot board that out, which I'll show you in just a second. Um, there should be a list of content, uh, key concepts of vocabulary that are coded as either conce uh, factual, conceptual, or procedural, and then a list of standard or objectives, each with how that's gonna be obsessed in parentheses at the end, all right? So that document should be done. Uh, that's our first big um, uh, deliverable for the course, all right? This is gonna be a live document. It's definitely subject to change. In our next lesson, we're gonna look at how we uh, move these building blocks or objectives around in order to make a meaningful uh, lesson that, that our series of lessons that really drive student success. Um, and we're gonna use something called hot boarding to do that. Um, my background as, a, as an entertainment person in radio and TV, we used a process called hot boarding to program uh, stations and shows and things like that. And it kind of looked like this, where we had different parts, and then we ordered those parts to make sense. And as things changed, we moved parts around and we were able to shift them. And again, we're going to work on that next week. All right. So again, make sure you have your standard template uh, built out. Uh, I hope this has helped. Feel free to rewatch it. And always feel free to reach out if there's something in there that you don't understand or if you're or you're struggling with or if during the activity that you're completing you're really you're having a disconnect reach out and contact all right uh, I hope it's helped and I really uh, am excited to to see your unpacking when you're done have a great week I'll see you soon